So, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, today, we'll be taking you through a number of aspects with modeling and CFD, uh, specifically looking at an apex and cradle workflow. Uh, my name is Dr. Stefan Evans. I'm the lead FEA engineer at Evotech CA Limited, and I'll be introducing a colleague, uh, Dr. Robert Duell, who is lead CFD engineer with Flow Computing Technologies and taking you through the workflow. So looking at the MSC product portfolio, we've got many different tools for uh, linear, non-linear FEA, material modeling, acoustics, explicit analysis, uh, multi-body dynamics, and now of course, fluid and thermal modeling with Cradle. Uh, all of this is underpinned by MSC Apex, the simulation and uh, simulation modeling and analysis platform, uh, specifically for FEA uh, in its own right and with the Nastram workflow. So myself, I've got 20 years experience uh, running EvoTech uh, with uh, lots of different uh, examples of projects that we've done from an FEA perspective. And joining me today is Robert Duell, who's a 20 year CFD veteran and uh, expert user in, in the Cradle technology. So we're gonna get working first of all with an example looking at a mixing tank. Uh, so we may have got this from an external CAD source. And we're gonna look at simplifying the geometry, idealizing it ready for CFD analysis. So we'll get started with some of the uh, geometry manipulation within the Apex environment. So we just open up an Apex database and then we can start to bring in geometry. So we've got to say geometry from an external CAD source, so we can bring in multiple uh, geometry formats, so many native CAD formats, uh, CATIA, SOLIDWORKS, CREO, all the, all the big uh, commercial products, and also translator formats, Parasolid, STEP, PIGIS, STL. Um, so we can see on the left-hand side uh, the model browser, which gives us a good indication of all of the parts that are made up in the, in the given imported assembly, this reflects the assembly architecture that the original CAD model was defined in. So we don't get a monolithic, uh, just a, a single level import. We do maintain the, uh, the hierarchy structure. Uh, very useful for manipulating your way around the model. So what we're gonna do here is simplify the geometry, uh, remove features that we don't need. So we've got a gearbox on the top there. We can simply uh, delete that in its own right. And then start to look around the model for uh, discrete regions which are, are not really needed in the in the fluid simulation analysis, the, the mixing analysis that we'll be looking at within the cradle environment shortly. So we can uh, highlight entities in, in the actual model view space and bring them up in the model browser in the tree structure on the left hand side and we can view and manipulate and, and delete if necessary those entities from the, from the overall model. You'll see that Apex has a very clear, uh, clean and clear user interface. So every function within the Apex environment, whether you're doing geometry manipulation like this or actually going for a full FEA model build, um, we've got video embedded support for every level of function within the environment. So it makes it really straightforward to get uh, into using Apex, uh, becoming really proficient uh, in, in, in hours really. You know, some, some products may take uh, days or weeks really to to, uh, to develop any level of proficiency. Um, so Apex is really straightforward to use, but but very powerful as well. It's not dumbed down in any way. It uses some very contemporary techniques to to allow you to to work in this manner. So again, we're just showing the central shaft here for a mixing tank, and some of the uh, just just popped out of view for a moment. And now we're going to just look at some of the defeaturing uh, functionality within Apex. So Apex is underpinned by what we call a direct modeling geometry engine. Uh, it was the first it was the first CAE uh, specific tool to use direct modeling in this way. Direct modeling uh, gives you very, very powerful geometry manipulation uh, and couple that with the FEA model build. Uh, we're not looking at this explicitly in this example, but if you had a meshed entity, you could manipulate the underlying geometry and the mesh would update automatically. Uh, very straightforward. So we just, taking out some, uh, some additional features on this central shaft. So we're just gonna split the tool, uh, split by plane. You saw there that you get very good uh, visual feedback in terms of any potential operation that's gonna take place. 
Uh, so splitting the shaft now, we've, we've moved it back by 250 millimeters. We're just going to now extend it forward. So just a, a, a number of different ways of manipulating this type of geometry, but we just got rid of the features that we don't need and uh, bringing the model up to speed for the CFD analysis. Looking at the, the lower mixing blades, we've got some features in there which, are, which would perhaps complicate or require additional mesh density changes in the, in the fluid simulation. So we're going to go into uh, de-feature that model, uh, th th those regions, and we've got a very uh, set of powerful, uh, powerful set of smart de-featuring tools that allow us to remove features of, of given dimensions, uh, holes, chamfers, fillets, etc. So we're just taking a couple of chamfers and, and the fillets off the, the upper blade, and again, really straightforward to work through. So we're going to skip forward a couple of steps here. And now look at, um, so we've moved through to the simplified geometry. We've deleted everything that we don't need. We're now going to look at the, uh, the fluid volume generation that's required by the, um, the, the, the CFD analysis we're going to be looking at in Cradle. So in the model browser on the left-hand side, we're just creating a sub-assembly and then a couple of discrete parts, uh, calling them liquid one and liquid two, uh, just, just to define a couple of cylindrical volumes which sit within the mixing tank to allow us to uh, better define the, the underlying uh, mesh for the, again, for the mixing simulation. So we can literally drag and drop um, entities within the product hierarchy or the, the assembly hierarchy. Really straightforward to work with the model in this manner. And then just measuring the internal diameter of the, the overall cylinder. Um, and then just taking that dimension and then sketching a surface on the, uh, the, sort of the external plane of the cylinder, or the, the utmost plane of the cylinder, and then redrawing that surface. So we're basically filling in the, um, the, the upper diameter uh, to allow us to, to generate the volume. So we've now got a surface in the model browser tree, and we can show only that particular region. And then we use, again, one of the uh, direct modeling functions. So this is push-pull. You may be familiar with this from other, um, other CAD-type tools, but certainly not in a, in a CAE environment. This, this is quite a new technique, really. So we just extrude that into the third dimension and then repeat that for the, the second liquid, or second, second liquid region, I should say. So we're going to set that as current uh, in the model browser. And then we can sketch a new surface cylindrical surface, rather a um, circular surface on, on, on the face of this existing volume, and then extruding that, extrude that up into the third dimension again, just to give us some volume control for the subsequent analysis. Again, great feedback. We can see everything that, that's going ahead. We, we, we get uh, indication of what, or visualization of what's going to happen before we, we do any operation. There's lots of what we call app cursor support. So we're inputting at the cursor, inputting data at the cursor, rather than having to go back and forth endlessly through um, deep sets of forms, uh, which you may have seen in other tools. So we've got a couple of cylinders now built into the the overall assembly architecture. Um, so structural entities defined, and also the the fluid volume entities as well. So we can uh, set the Transparency. So again, lo lots of really powerful display controls. So we're just we're just changing the transparency of the overall assembly, so you can see the relationship between the volumes and the the central shaft and the mixing blades. Uh, obviously, very important for the subsequent analysis. So we're now in a position where we've cleaned up the geometry, and again, bear in mind that this is all done through uh, a single MSC one license. So if we've got licenses for Apex, we've got licenses for Cradle. We can export the parasolid file and then take that through into the Cradle environment. So we're just going to move on now to the, uh, the second stage in the workflow where we look at this with the Cradle CFD analysis. And I'll hand you over now to my colleague, Robert Dool, who will talk about the CFD simulation of the initial design. Thank you, Steph. Welcome, everyone. I'm Rob, the lead CFD engineer at Flow Computing Technologies. This two cubic meter tank has been designed to heat up the water like fluid faster by keeping it moving and in continuous contact with the heated shell. 
The aim is to design a mixer which makes a nice unbroken free fluid surface while the fluid is stirred. Astiflow has several automated processes that make such a motion simulation pretty easy and fast. When I'm choosing rotating motion in pass control, the software automatically applies mesh and other settings to speed things up. I only need to register the fluid volume that envelopes all rotating solids. This is the second cylindrical liquid region around the blades, staff created in Apex, and to tell which part we rotate with it by sorting them into the moving part group. Next is building analysis model, which basically means automatic small surface tests, filling closed cavities, and if all checks out, final step is tessellation, which means splitting the model surfaces into small triangles. In part material section, I'm choosing all three fluid volumes and giving them air incompressible material for the moment, because I will set the fluid phase in the free surface feature later on. In region registration, I'll start with a numerical region called initial water level, and this tells which part of the tank is filled with fluid before we start spinning the blades. Fluid level will be at 1.1 meter. Preview shows that the plane is at the correct height. There is no inlet and outlet in this geometry, so I can't place a zero pascal static pressure on any of the surfaces. But the solver has to know what the pressure in the tank is, so I'm registering a point in the top corner, away from the fluid, and I will apply static pressure to this point later on. When I built the analysis model, I used a feature to automatically associate CAD model colors with surface region names. I have a list of RGB colors and region names, and when the model building tool finds a color in the CAD file, it names the surface accordingly. And it works a treat. The thin edges of the top blade are not in the blade edges region, but I need these to assign finer mesh here, so to quickly show you how it goes, I'm adding them to the blade edges region manually. Here are the two blades, but I only need the top one, so I hide everything else. I activate the region registration feature and I click on the blade edges region in the list because I'd like to make this region name active so that I can save myself the hassle of typing the name in again. I'm deselecting the big surfaces of the top blade one by one, there are only five of them so it doesn't take too long. This way only the thin edges will stay marked so when clicking register SCFlow asks if I want to add them to the existing region and that's it. Regions are now complete. In condition settings I pick free surface from the available features. Free surface needs a transient analysis and I set 2000 iterations with 0.01 seconds time step. These give 20 seconds runtime. I'm referring to the plane set by the initial water level numerical region to tell which part of the tank is filled with fluid before rotation starts. The next step deals with walls and I'm setting every surface outside the rotating region as a static wall, and the same applies to buffles as well. I really like the easy and simple way I can define motion settings in SC flow. I need to set the angular velocity of the rotating region only, all the submerged solids will automatically move with it. Preview looks fine, but it would be a bit more realistic if I make a table where I can set RPM as a function of time. Let's create the RPM curve so that it starts with a one second long ramp up period, and adding more time and RPM pairs, the table will cover the 20 second long simulated time. Every other settings related to moving parts are defined automatically. This is a huge step forward next to SC Tetra, for example, where it takes a lot more manual work to set up rotating meshes. In free surface, I choose air incompressible for gas region and incompressible water as the liquid region. With water chosen, its surface tension is automatically set. In output settings I tell the software to save every 40th iteration 
and the initial field to have a results file showing the initial undisturbed free surface too. Torque needed to turn the shaft is an important figure for the mechanical designer because it helps him choose the right motor and gear drive and it's important to me because it's a very good indicator of a converging solution so I'd like to know it in every iteration. With this boundary conditions are all set. In acid flow mesh element sizes are represented by cubes also known as octants. Size and number of octants on a surface show how small and how many elements a surface will have when the mesh is ready. There are manual or full automatic modes. In manual mode I can set minimum and maximum base cube size, both are 20 mm here, and in regions I can assign smaller octant sizes to surfaces that need better resolution. I can set octant sizes for all important regions one by one, or I can use one of my macros, which is a recording of a previous manual octant size assignment. It has the list of region names and cube sizes as a text file, and I can replay it to set everything in one go. These macros work best if I keep surface region names the same. If I follow my naming rules in every geometry version of the Mixing Tank project, I'll be able to reuse the same macro for all of them and it will save me a lot of time. I can check how octant sizes look before mesh is finalized. In a cross section, as you can see, blade edges have smaller element sizes exactly the way I wanted. If there's a volume or surface that needs further refinement, I can do that by changing the octant size in the macro and run it again, or I can do it manually by selecting octants on the surface. I can mark any registered region and make the software show the octant size. I'm showing parts within the rotating region and as you can see there are two different octant sizes on these components. Fine enough mesh on thin edges of the blades and on the bottom shaft support will ensure the simulation runs without problems. In mesh parameters I'd like to use three boundary layers around solid walls as default but in details I have the same full control and I can use the list of regions to give more layers and a different thickness to any registered surface. I also want to change default volume mesh settings because I want hex elements inside fluid volumes to have a nice, well-oriented mesh and I can further reduce the overall mesh size. Axiflow makes a mesh of tetra and hex elements first which would contain 2.5 million elements. The polyhedral conversion merges tetrahedrons and by this it can reduce overall mesh size to 750,000. I have the mesh ready and as you can see every triangle on the surfaces has been merged to polygons and every remaining tetrahedron in the volume has been merged to polyhedrons. When I cut the mesh in half to show you a cross section you can notice three different element types. At the walls there are three layers of prismatic elements, their base is a polygon which were extruded into the volume mesh. Layer thickness follows size of the nearest polyhedron. Inside the volumes there are cube elements that were created to follow the orientation of the coordinate system. These give structured nodes, so symmetric flow patterns can be more easily maintained. Between these two types there are polyhedrons to efficiently fill up the space and to ensure the smallest possible mesh size. I'm firing up the solver and starting the simulation takes dragging and dropping the simulation settings file into it. The settings file was saved together with the whole project after mesh calculation was finished. It is a text file just like the Octree macro and it can be edited without running SC flow if you want to change something quickly. I usually make the user interface of the solver show velocity components, but pressure or turbulence values can also be followed. Depending on the computer it would take some time to finish this job, but I have the results ready, so here they are. Well, I don't really like what I see here at 20 seconds, because the free surface is broken and air is mixed into the fluid. The intermediate result at 10 seconds isn't any better either. This tank is supposed to get the fluid moving to increase heat transfer at the heated shell, so the fluid can get warmer faster. 
The ideal result would show a nice unbroken free fluid surface with some minimal vortex near the shaft. But to sum it up, we are not there yet. If I play the video the software makes of the results, we can see the whole 20 second long process. It is just the first 20 seconds, but I'm quite sure once the fluid surface is broken, water will never be able to settle again. There will always be some gas mixed into the fluid, so heat transfer won't be good enough. Tor graph also tells that something is not okay, because after 10 seconds it drops, showing there is way too much air around the blades. Steph, could you change the top blade from pitch to vertical one? I think we need to move it a bit lower as well, and in the upgraded design can you extend buffles to reach the top of the tank with gaps at the vessel wall, please? Back to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Robert. Uh, that, that gives a really good insight into the, the fluid response. Uh, just, just a quick aside, while the CFD work was taking place, I looked at a quick FEA model build to understand the normal modes of the structure. So again, we've got fully featured FEA capability within Apex, uh, whether we're running with the internal solver or external MSE Nastran or third party tools. Um, we can use Apex as part of that, that workflow. That's uh, so a very powerful technique. Um, or techniques available to us. So the, the design modification that, that Robert mentioned, uh, I think he was talking about some of the blade pitching and the, the, the overall blade positions. Uh, so we're just going to look at some of those modifications here. Uh, so just going into the model and simplifying things, uh, just, to, just to pull out the particular region that we're going to modify. Um, so just showing only the, the upper blade. Uh, so showing this purple region here, so we can see the 45 degree pitch we had on that original definition. So we're just going to use some of the direct modeling tools um, just to manipulate the geometry. You see on the left hand side there, I just used the uh, the triad just to update the model view. So we've got very clean and clear, clean and clear uh, interaction with the model without having reams and reams of icons. We can just simply do it all from this, this triad, We're looking at normal views and isometric views and rotating the model and what have you. So just splitting the geometry here, uh, splitting by a face, so we've picked the cylindrical face of the hub and split the, the overall blade into three discrete parts. We're just going to delete one of those, those blades because it's symmetric, so we're going to make the changes just to one, one side and then we can uh, rotate or mirror the, the, the uh, amended blade around to its new position. Um, so we're halving the work that we need to do by doing this. Using the transform manipulator, again, lots of powerful controls here, all, all set and controlled through a very simple uh, user preview interface. So we can see here we're, we're setting an angle um, and we, we get an update of what the, the object's gonna do. There was a typo in there, I don't know if you saw that, but I, I rotated the model by minus four degrees and then by positive 45 degrees, so we've got, a, again, a misalignment. So if you just use the, um, the, the transform manipulator again, just viewing uh, normal to the plane, we can see that misalignment. So again, rotating by four degrees, and we can use the right-hand rule or, or get the update uh, live on screen. So we can see the four degrees sets that back now to, to a vertical pitch. So very straightforward. And now we can start to chop the, the purple blade up into um, uh, a representation that matches the hub, um, hub definition. So at the moment, the blade is slightly longer than the hub. So we're just going to split based on the upper plane of the hub. And repeat that top and bottom. And again, update a preview of the, the cutting plane. Uh, so we've now got two new entities in the model browser. We can delete those. Uh, we, we would make these changes. Obviously, we're doing this for, for an external CFD analysis. But equally, if we're looking at uh, two or 3D meshing for an FEA perspective, we could um, idealize in a very similar manner. And lots of powerful tools here that um, give you access to, to that functionality. So just removing some of the features that extend into the hub, the 
um, central central bore, so just tidying those up. And then we're just going to measure. We've got a couple of fillets here that we, we could have defeatured um, previously, but uh, we're, we're just doing those in a manual sense now. So just looking at the uh, the smart defeaturing tool, we're just taking out those the features that it finds. Uh, because we made the cuts, we're going to use the manual approach. So we can just simply select the face and it will extend the, the two adjoining faces and remove the, the feature at both ends. Okay. So tidy that up nicely, showing the uh, the hub again. And we can now use a, a Boolean operation to, to effectively join those two solids together into a single entity. Uh, the, the colors updated, of course, now uh, based on the definition in the model browser. And now we can use the um, push-pull tool to create fillets uh, based on the dimension we've just measured, picking the two edges that we want to fillet, and then typing in the, uh, the, the value at the cursor so we're not having to populate forms go back and forth with it. So a few less keystrokes you have to deal with, um, and now we can rotate the overall body to, to generate the the uh, symmetric side as well. So we're going to we're going to move the manipulator. Uh, we've got these um, these smart um, points up here. So we pick the edge and we're just going to move the manipulator or the origin of the manipulator to the, the center of the, the cylindrical um, diameter. Rotate by 180 degrees, and we've now got the the blade fully defined. Boolean operation again just to bring the two bodies together as a single entity. Uh, we've got a couple of edges left behind, sort of residual edges from the original blade definition. So we're just gonna change the selection filter to edges and then delete edges which are not required just to tidy up the geometry, give us that clean definition. So again, really straightforward means of manipulating the geometry um, and really fast in, in terms of uh, workflow. So we're just going to measure the distance here between the, uh, the the gap between the two blades, and then we're going to transform the upper blade and move it down in a vertical sense uh, based on um, the design modification that Robert was talking about uh, previously. So once we've got that, we can then export the geometry as, as necessary back into the cradle environment. Uh, lots of interface here, so just just to understand the the design updates, we go back into the simulation uh, for the modified design. Thanks, Steph, for the new geometry. Since modifications only affect a few parts, basically everything that relates to the rotating motion settings is the same. This is why I can happily use the project file of the initial design with all of its settings again. Not that the original process seemed tedious, but this trick speeds it up even more. All I'm doing is I'm dropping the new geometry into the already open old project. Now I have all parts of both designs in the past list, so I need to do a little cleaning here. Within the initial geometry I'm picking the old buffles and delete them and I'm also getting rid of the old top blade. From the parts list of the new design, I move buffles into the static parts group and the new top blade into the moving parts group of the old geometry. Rest of the new design contains unchanged parts I already have in the old geometry, so these can be deleted, we don't need them anymore. The good thing about using a consistent part and surface color structure in the CAT file is that regions of a new part with the same color as the old one has become part of the already registered surface region when I loaded the new geometry in. I use this smart feature heavily when working with design changes. Since I changed some parts of the old model, I need to run the model building again with all of its geometry checks. The result is an MDR file which basically is an SDR file with more information in it. From this point the whole process is the same, but since the old project has kept all of its settings, analysis setup is even faster than the one before. For example, under motion parameters I have the same RPM table and since center of rotation is the same as the old one, other motion settings will do fine as well.
The system also has cut the same free surface settings as before. Yes, you're right, I have to recalculate optums and mesh because the geometry has been changed, but I can use the same script to define optums. And again, octum size assignment is this fast because surface region names are the same as in the old design. A cross-section of the model shows that oak tree sizes look similar to the one I have made for the initial design. Blades and their edges get the smallest elements. Everything is ready to recalculate mesh and to run solver again, but you have already seen that a few moments ago, so I just jumped to the results. Let's check out what the new results show compared with the old geometry. I loaded both series of saved results into a single post-processor window. On the left, is the initial design with pitch top blade and short baffle plates. On the right is the result of our design change. If I spin the two results together, the difference is quite obvious from every angle. What I'm showing you here is the shape of the free fluid surface at 20 seconds. SCFlow saved the video of the new design as well, and when I play it together with the old one, we can see the whole 20 second long mixing process. Though the new version still has the center vortex, and I'm sure if I had kept it running longer, we would have seen a similar but probably not that severe flow and air mixing pattern. But we have definitely achieved an improvement, because the vortex forms much slower than before. Looking at the tall graphs, these also tell that the new design on the right is better, Graph is much closer to a good and horizontal shape within these 20 seconds than before. Well, in a real-life design process, this modified geometry would be just the first step in a series of design changes. But we have the right tools to quickly change the shape and to set the simulation up with the least manual interaction. I believe this efficiency is what matters when working with design changes. Thank you and back to you, Steph. Okay, Robert, thank you for that excellent presentation showing the, the complete workflow uh, back and forth between Apex as a design modeler and FEA tool and a Cradle SC flow for the CFD and mixing tank analysis. Um, if you need any further information, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch. You'll see the email addresses available for myself, uh, Steph Evans, and Robert Duell. Uh, who's um, listed there as well, um, and we'll draw it to a close. Okay, thanks for attending.